We're starting today with Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God and beloved children. Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. Offering the sacrifice of God as a fragrance of love. That is valid. Helen's coming. She's parking. Who is? Helen. Paul has spent four chapters telling us, for the most part, the strength of the gospel, spelling it out rather clearly. And in typical Paul, Pauline, long sentence fashion. Now, in chapter five, he says, Therefore, with me, in light of what I'm Written to you, and or we had the four chapters. Here's what I want you to do. This is what this calls for. This one who has, before the foundation of the world, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ, and given us an inheritance in Him. That first chapter is all the in Him, in Christ, in the beloved. Now arrived at chapter five. That now therefore, in light of all that, here's what should be taking place in your life. And as is as is the case in real life, an imitation can never be the real thing. Randall, do you remember what great theologian said? We're to be little Christ's. Remember that? That part of it? You don't remember who it was? I, I cannot remember who it was. I, I disagree with you. Because I don't think we can be little Christ. There's only one real Christ. Uh, to be an imitator of Him does not mean we become Him. Become more like him, perhaps. And then that's determined by who you have to deal with. And some people you have to deal with, they just take just a whole lot more energy than others. You just kind of hide what comes from the snow. Some people are just breezes, just this easy, easy boat. Just as with Elvis Presley, there are a lot of good imitators out there, but they ain't the real Elvis. Some are better than others, but no one has the ability to replicate him to the fullest extent. Not the case, but the most. Certain ways, yes, with his singing ability, with his charisma, but maybe not in other things we need to put his end of life, what he did behind closed doors. No. But he cannot be Elvis. He like cannot be him. Neither can we in our limitations. In our imitation of God in Christ, be the real Messiah or a little Messiah. That's one of the problems we face when we try to imitate Him, is we, we think we're better than others in, in imitating Him, which means we have judged Him to be less effective or not quite as effective as we think we are. And that's when the competition starts. Methodist truth bound 
found it determined to be better imitated than Christ in fact. We know we are experience. So the old game of uh, competing, comparing. Every time we compete and compare, whether it's positively or negatively, our eyes have been removed from the one whom we are. And the longer our eye is away from the one one that we are to be in the day, the less we in the day. We've been compromised by our sin. We've been created in His image, but we are not Him. I think maybe there have been folks here who have told us that we ought to be ashamed of ourselves not being being him. We didn't actually say that maybe. But the pressure is there. You seem to be better Christians. Me and I may be an error on this than an error on one or two things in my life. Me best imitator of Christ is the one who tells me that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. We've allowed ourselves the illusion that we can love as he loved, do as he did, be as he was and is, always will be. And that is an illusion it is demonic in its source. Now, that doesn't mean that I should try. I should always be trying to, to represent him better. You be always, always be trying to uh, love as he loves. And in reality, we know for a fact that we can't do that. This illusion is demonic in the truest sense of the word demonic. When you see, it's the lie that Adam, that Satan told Adam and Eve in the garden. That same lie that he had been telling all of their children. Oh boy, he's not. He's not. You'll know as he knows. You'll be just like him. You'll, you'll think like him. You will reason like him. You will, you will be like him. And who, who would fall for that? Who, who, who is it that doesn't want to be better than they are? Although I think I know what Wesley meant when he said that we were to quote poem we have erred in our thinking that we would ever arrive at that state. And then you fall back into that old game of competition again. Well, Andy, I'm better along than you are. And you see, the problem of this, that is when Andy suffers in her concept of who I think she is. That's wrong. Well, that as well as I judge you as less than I think you are the best. Who am I to do that? The Mormons sing one of their hymns in it. It says, Who am I to judge another when I walk the first? Or Jesus put it perhaps more succinctly. You without sin pick up the stone, start throwing. That's the first stone. There's not a one of them in this room there. She pick up the We just 
Now, we're better than some of the others, and that's judging too. But those that do wrong and harm intentionally to others, yeah, we're a lot better than them. In that regard. Then on the other hand, if we need them, that may be more compassionate to us than we can get out of that. We really don't see the whole picture. I think Wesley wanted us never to stop trying, never to stop yearning for and striving toward the goal. But I also don't believe Wesley ever thought we would arrive at the state where only God is and ever can be. If we could arrive at where God is in his state of perfection, we'd be called God's in the state of Probably, probably would even defy the word perfection. We think that we can arrive there, then we will no longer need him when we get there. If we can do it in this life, then we don't need to do it in the next life. That's why our obsession with thinking we can love unconditionally errs on the side of arrogance. Uh, are even knowing it. At a funeral on Saturday, this young lady who's of mixed heritage uh, married once, lived with two together, three children, I think there might have been three dads in that internet. I'm telling you, work, work. Uh, work at a night, but she was a manager of a night. Lay down about, she didn't, about a week, she didn't have any issues with intestinal infection. She, uh, she would lie down about five o'clock in the afternoon and rest or sleep. So by day, that her oldest child, Ian, was still away from her, so she doesn't have any time to get dressed to go to work. I'm sitting away from her. And I uh, two gay fellows that live with the them. She was homeschooled with a tree. And uh, he had taken his partner to work. So the oldest child called him and uh, then called the granddad who lived. Well, that would be his great kiss her friend because she was, he was his, his, he and his mom was the, was the man's granddaughter. And called him and he, it was about 8 o'clock. So he had, he started to dress for bed, so he had to redress, get out and get across the road. Now he got there, the, the, the friend was back. Already doing CPR and coroner told him later that not to tell him he had been gone for an hour or two before they cut the way. They broke out of drugs and alcohol and an animal common cold. But they uh, still don't know what the cause is. They may not know the word. I think she was septic or she may have had an intestine. Whatever it was, her stepfather at the service said that she loved unconditionally. A lot of this meant that she loved a whole lot more freely than a lot of church folks. She would look at folks and not judge them on the basis of their color or how they dress what their aspirations in life were or were not. But uh, I didn't miss it. Not time to play. I still am firmly convinced that we cannot love the traditional. We could do a Godfrey love in the fullest sense of the word. We would not be a Godfrey love. We would just go. So, uh, we'll 
admit that she was had been wanting to and, and, and receiving people for who they were. She was rather a that because her grandparents raised her. With her mom realized she was expecting the bad news. And then come back and do with her life until she was almost wanted to pick up where he met across the four people. She knew I loved unconditionally. If we could obtain perfection in God's incarnation in Christ Jesus was a mistake on his part. He had tried covenants with his children that had not worked. Verbal covenants. He had tried guidelines, which is the big pen, which they made in another 639 copies. And that didn't work. Because they began to keep the law as a legal defense to save them themselves without the need of the one who had made them. Wanted to gain his favor. So finally, he came to us in a form much like us, but not in human weakness alone. He came to us because we could not be made right with him in our attempts to please him. The phrase, as beloved children, you find that in verse 1 there. Phrase, as beloved children sets parameters for our liberty, our imitating him. Because he loved us and loves us in the perfection of his beloved son, we become beloved children. Where Jesus not his beloved son, we could not be his beloved children. We are beloved because he has a beloved son. Because he loved us and loved us in his perfection and his beloved son, we become beloved children. We are beloved because his son is beloved by him. I'm told you the story of Chuck Lane. Anybody know Chuck Lane? He's a professional. And Chuck was born and raised here and left here and found his bride and they married and they had. Stephanie and then they had Brian. They had Brian first because they had Stephanie. Brian says, oh, he's in, I guess he's in his fifties now. He's not married. He's a good guy. But he was your typical teenage boy. And then he gave him a few tips. That some children are going to do. Seems like you just set out for it. Well, one Sunday morning after men's breakfast, Chuck cornered me and oh goodness, Brian did it. I can't remember what it was Brian had done, but it, it wasn't nice, I'll tell you that. But he was just oh goodness, he was so disappointed, he was angry at his son for what he'd done and all of this. It's on and on. Oh, it's gonna be late for sure. Sunday school hour I didn't know when he was going to So finally, when he took a, a breath, I gave him a chance to jump in. I said, Chuck, God rewarded us to have perfect children. He's going to give us perfect happiness. Maybe it was fine. I kind of knew this. I thought about it. He's going to attack me or not? But he just turned around and saw me. Came back later and she reached his grinning to his body. I'm expecting him to be better than I am. And I know what I was like at his age. He's a lot better than I was when I was his age. So he 
remove the day, but the day is the day. But it's always the same. That was one of the best lessons he had learned to learn. Was not to expect more from the children than he did expect from the adults. Let's God does not give our children perfect parents. He did give the parents his perfect son as an offering and a sacrifice in order to make them righteous in his sight. And herein lies the plan of salvation, by the way. It is God's doing and our receiving, not our doing and his receiving. Because walk in love means simply that we're to walk or live in the love with which Christ has loved us. We often, not only in Paul's writings, but in other writings of the New Testament, we hear the phrase, love one another. It's a command. And we erroneously uh, think we can love one another as he has loved us. Folks, we cannot. If we could, we wouldn't need his love. But love one another in the love with which he has loved us, which is unconditional, which is the agape love. The clause walk in love means simply that we are to walk or live in the love with which Christ has loved us. To imitate God is to accept his offer of his son as the only fragrant aroma that is pleasing to the Father. So I have to realize that if I attempt to love you and to love others, Kevin included, is to do what I can that I think is best for you through me. But I must accept the reality that it will never, ever, and should never be a replacement for the saving love that comes in the foundation. It will always be conditioned. Conditioned one day on how I feel about If I feel better about you the next day, then it's probably going to be easier to love you. It's all based on me, you say. And at times it's based on you. My I have to break my feet. And say again, I don't feel like again, I still love you. It's a little thing. I can try, but only his love through me can be with me God love. Mine is going to be filled with how I think about it, what I feel about it. We cannot love as Christ loved, or else we would not need him. Not to need him is to reject him. Sometimes we border on such rejection when we offer him any help to save us. Lord, I be sure you be sure you add the good deeds I did last week to make it more acceptable and precise. There is nothing we can do to make ourselves acceptable in his sight, except that which is done in the name of Christ. The ancient fathers of the faith had a mantra which they chanted frequently. Perhaps it would be good for us to learn it to do the same. Their mantra was solo Cristo, solos for the pure, Sola fide. This interpreted means only Christ, only Scripture, only faith. And the order of this mantra was important. When Christ is the only Savior and Scripture is his guidelines, then faith becomes a reality in our living. 
Try to begin with faith. Deny grace. It drops the place in our life. Uh, before last, one of the two Sundays in January, we got to be at our own church. The Sunday school teacher wasn't there, so we're, we're using the International Lesson Series as a year old. Okay. We didn't cancel the subscription in 2020 when we didn't need. So we're using it even though it's one day off. That's kind of we're still using it. And the lesson was about um, hope. And so they asked me, will you teach the lesson today? No. We're going to talk about the text. That's what we're going to look at. One of the first things we looked at was the title was something about praying for hope. Praying that he would strengthen our hope. And so we spent nearly an hour looking at that and the text. And I told him, I said, you know, we've been taught this, Grant, but we need to talk to these people. You don't have any hope, what do you do? Pray for it, don't you? You don't have any peace, what do you do? You pray for it. You don't have any joy, what do you get? What do you do? You pray for it. Now, I wish I had the Greek for it. Did not so you just don't have to. I'm gonna do it imaginary. You don't have to imagine. Use your imagination. You still got some of I said, here we are, sick people. Here we are, sick people. And there's these little dots going up. So these little dots represent our prayer. There's this great big circle up here, and this glob, this circle is God. So we little sick people are constantly throwing up prayers. Lord, give me peace. Lord, give me faith. Increase my faith is another way of saying the same thing. Give me hope. And we take this log, we sprinkle back down. Oh, she needs some peace. I'm gonna give I'll give her some peace. I only need a little bit of she needs to increase her faith. I'm going to sprinkle down some faith on honey. What we've done is we've taken these precious gifts. We've made them commodities. And don't, don't bother giving me anything. I think it's good today. I just give you peace. When in reality, according to Scripture, God does not sprinkle peace, faith, hope, love, and joy. God sprinkles the whole God. He is our peace. He doesn't get it. He is our peace. He is our joy. When he is near, faith becomes a strong reality. Peace becomes a common reality. Hope becomes something that's stronger than God does not give any gift but himself. But we ask for him only in the ways that we want what we want, what we want. So we can spread the Lord, I want more faith, I, I want more peace, I want more hope, I want more this, I want more that. Not bad things, pray for us. But it reflects the theology that God's going to sprinkle back down what we want in the way that we want it. And in reality, the incarnation says God did not did not send us a baby. God sent us Himself as a baby. You see the difference? Right? You're not guilty. Because the one that taught us, somebody taught them the same thing. 
They didn't teach it, it's in person. And, and what we are asking for in these sprinkles is second and jump. Good job. What's wrong with that? But it's second hand. Lord, I you get glow. I, I don't I don't want you to just give me some peace. Give me some faith. Jesus said that as much one day people came to him and they won't even they won't even heal. They won't even tend to, to straighten out the tragedy of the lost love. I didn't want him. I didn't want him to do for him. to give him. In every instance in the gospel, Jesus did not give anybody anything but of himself. And it may be. And they were the teacher of faith. And you know, when you, when you, if you're not careful, you can come across this and see you in an error. So I kept on my church. It was about praying for something. Right? What is he there? What is he doing? You're supposed to greater reality. First thing you did. I wanted to tell the class, and I'm, I'm telling you because you're, we're in Bible sections, and we can do a give and take here. There, they, for that particular teacher, there's not much to all give in those things. He's a good teacher, but he said that, that since we he's been the boss of a, of a company for, until he retired, and so therefore, uh, he didn't expect much uh, give and take. Good. Oh, I wanted to tell them so badly that I do not pray that he will increase my faith. I pray that he will make parents crazy. Make me aware of the weakness. Then faith blossom. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If God is distant, it's not because God is distant, it's because we're not aware of Him. He's already here. He's already with us. God, you just said it. You weren't lying there, were you? I know. You hear that in times in my life when I was in prayer. Okay, we're saying the same thing. So my prayer should not be, Lord, come near. And he said, well, you idiot, I'm closer than, than you are. I can't get any nearer without taking your life. And he can make us aware. Yeah. So the prayer should be, Father, I'll be essential more than I am right now. You want to learn how to pray? The ancients prayed. They set out to read the Psalms and reread the Psalms and reread the Psalms and reread the Psalms. In there, he says, Bless my soul, O oh Lord. He said, doesn't say, Now, Lord, I just want you to bless my soul. Bless my soul. As God's children made in his image, we have the authority, we have the right. We have the privilege 
I'm not, we're not commanding him to do something that he's not already doing. But it's great. Lift up my eyes, Lord. Show me your face. Show me your show me your hand in person. Instead of begging him to do something. Just clarify what he's already doing. The best pastoral prayer is not now, Lord, we just want to thank you. I hope you don't do this. I don't think you. Lord, we just want to thank you. And he says in response, well, I want you to do more than just thank me. I want you to serve me. Lord, we, we just want to. And he said, that all you want? Bless my soul, Lord, Lord. Teach me your righteousness. Teach me what it means to be your child. Help me be aware. Make me aware of your presence. And folks, we have that right. Why? Well, it says right there in that phrase, as beloved children. We are beloved children. Not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. We are beloved children. Not that we will be if we act right. We are beloved children. Because it's not based on what we do or don't do. It's based on what he has done for us. Already. And when we receive that, hmm, it's the strangest thing, but we, we begin to behave better. We begin to behave more like him. I think I saw a hand. Almost a Yeah, I saw a hand. Go ahead, Valerie. I can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> oh, we all I know that. Go ahead, though. <laughs> Uh, what comes to my mind is that the Lord, you know, when Jesus was crucified, we got a comforter, and we have the Holy Spirit within us. Yeah. And we have to rely on the gift of the Spirit to help us, because we have love for Jesus, and, you know, the gifts that we get, if they are already ours, are they not? Yes, they are ours. But yet we turn right around and in prayer we ask for them. Ask for the glory of God. He said, Ain't you got enough? But this is where what you said comes into play. Lord, you bless me with your spirit, with the gifts that He has. To manifest through me, make me aware of this so that I will utilize these gifts as He sees fit. Now, we do not determine what gift or gifts He manifests through us. That's not our domain, that's His. What we want to be is more aware that He wants to manifest these gifts through us. And sometimes He has to get us out of the way to do it because we get in the way. We want to do it our way. I got a better way of doing it, Lord. Now let me let me show you. I, I got a better way. And there is no better way than, than when He blesses others through us when we don't even know that He's done it. Because if we if we knew that He had done it, we would say, I wish you'd have done that a little different. I got a better way than that. You're where you're where I'm coming from, man. We're saying the same thing. Identically the same thing. We pray for what we already have. We just want it the way we want it. My wife's bad about that. She'll ask a question. And I'm not downgrading her. I'm just saying, this is Linda. And she's said about her, she ain't going to change. I know that. But this is how she was raised. This is what her parents taught her. She'll ask me a question. I'll answer that question. And then she'll then turn and qualify my answer because it wasn't stated the way she thought it could have been stated. You, you, don't, you don't do it as that way. I thought wives were supposed to do that. <laughs> is that is that a definition of a wife? Well, yeah. One who restates the male. <laughs> 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 
Refined. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 I'm going to love it this. <laughs> these, these adjectives of what you ladies are all about. Um, if what I say is what she thinks it should have been, then she simply repeats what I said. And I know I'm okay. I got it right the first time. <laughs> um, and we laugh about it. She and I do. Because you know what? After 54 years, we're going to do the same thing. And she's taking up some of my habits, and I've taken up some of her habits. But I guess that's what married life is all about, I guess. Now, how do we get off on that? <laughs> From what Paul was saying here. Therefore, we imitators of God. Don't be God. Don't try to be God. Don't try to replace Him. Imitate Him. Well, what's God like? If you want to know what God's like, the only thing we know how God is like is when we look at Jesus as His supposed representation of the Bible. And that's what He tells us in that second per, uh, the first phrase as beloved children. We are beloved children because His Son is His beloved Son. And walk in love. Now, really, we should capitalize the word love there. Because in the love that we know has been reproduced, you can't capitalize it. It's just human love. The love in which we will walk is what kind of love? Agape love. We walk in that love. We don't reproduce it, we just walk in it, live in it, absorb it, love it, eat it, sleep it. And how do we know that's a God they love? Well, look at the clause that Paul is there. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. Now you talk about a God they love. And it's the only love that is an offering and a sacrifice that is sweet to the Father. Now we could keep on on this, y'all, y'all, are we, are we all together at this point? Can we move on or do y'all want to, is anybody you want to talk about this not here? <laughs> if not, then I guess we can move on to um, verse 3. Now, if you're wondering what this nebulous word love is all about, let's find out by looking at what's opposite of this. If you're going to imitate God, then immorality, impurity, and greed, don't even discuss it among yourselves. It's good for the way to say don't waste your time talking about the immorality of America. Don't talk about the impurity or greed in America. Don't waste your time because talking about it, it in plain English, you ain't going to change it. You said, but don't even talk about it, which means literally, don't waste your time discussing it. It is a waste of time. We didn't get to where we are right now as Americans, and we ain't going to get out of it overnight if we get out of it at all. Immorality, impurity, greed, don't even talk about it because it ain't proper for saints to do that. We're saints now, did you know that? Now, not like St. Bob and St. Amy, St. Teresa, or any of those great characters that, uh, that have been canonized as saints. We're saints simply because we are in the kingdom of God. Anyone in the kingdom is a saint. 
They're better representation, better represent, representatives of sainthood than us. But then there are those that are not as good a representative of sainthood as we are, or as we think we are. And those two are different from us. And there must be no filthiness in city talk. Well, that certainly does curb it, doesn't it? Or coarse jesting. Joking. Uh, now, now don't, don't interpret that that we can't tell somebody the best, juiciest joke you've heard lately. That could be told in public and in front of you. Don't, don't, don't take it that far. But if that joke is one that you have to choose which company you tell it in, then maybe we shouldn't be bothering with that. By the way, you know, like I said, I'll tell you, you favor for the ladies. You know. <laughs> he says it's not fitting. If you want to spend your time doing the best things, then spend your time thinking. Thank you. And it'll be good. for being my constant reminder that there's a better English way to say it, even though we've probably forgotten more than we've ever learned. Thank you, Bob, for all those years you talked frankly and seriously frankly. The hours you spent preparing. So thank you for being here and knowing that you're a part of us. And though you, you belong here in membership, you know, but, but you do. So thank you for coming and being faithful. And, and when it's like, no, I hear you, you tell me she's at Dr. Salt. She said, you know, hey, oh, I like you, Morgan. I, I think I think Morgan, you know, more she is, more like you, I hear that. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this church, for offering your comment. Thank you, Lord, we think he's talked too much. Thank you for sharing the things you share with us, the experiences. Thank you for being with us and, and for absorbing, talking, sharing, ramble, for having the guts to be their pastor. Mm -hmm. Your guts let me be here to be your pastor. <laughs> well, I have one truth yet. <laughs> I was going to say they're extraordinary yes. gifts yes. of allowing you to be here. And you, and for, you. for speaking to us and being here every Thursday, yeah. welcoming us and loving us, helping us to see and remind us who we are. So thank you. See, see what Thanksgiving does? Better than any joke you could have. It, better than any gossip we can share, although you may know something that I would like to hear. <laughs> uh, better than talking about the condition of America in her good years and in, in her not so good years. Better than talking talking about all these heathen now. Or if we suddenly either. Uh he said, give him a thanks. Go over to Philippians. You want to look at a beautiful, marvelous text. Go to Philippians, I think it's the, the last chapter. He said, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. What is the will of God concerning us in Christ? It's amazing what thinking does. And please don't sell it short. Don't just, just want to thank somebody. Go ahead and thank them. You realize that in English, don't you? That when you say, I just want to thank you, Annie, for your gift to me, I've not thanked you at all. I just told you I wanted to. That's all it does. 
So thanks to you. Well, I just want to The giving of thanks. You see, the giving of thanks is an acknowledgement that we are recipients, that we are not totally 100% self-made. We rely upon each other in the gifts that we share together. We rely on him for giving us himself. And that's where thanksgiving comes strong uh, to end the sentence of mercy. The giving of thanks. For this you know for, with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man or person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now let's be careful with that. It's because some of us get caught up in immorality in a moment, or impurity in some fashion, or we cut it what we shouldn't cut. It doesn't mean we would be tossing us out of the kingdom. He's not saying that. He is saying that for when this becomes a lifestyle, we are the ones who have removed ourselves a distance from being in his kingdom. He does not kick us out. We remove ourselves in the practice of immorality, in the practice of impurity, in the practice of being covetous. When we become, when we become idolaters, now, when we think of these words, we think of all of the, the dirty things you can think about when you think about being immoral and impure and covetous. Let's talk about what about, about being idolaters with the faith, in the faith. Let's see if all of this immorality, impurity, this greediness, this covetous, let's, let's push that all aside. Can we be idolaters in the faith? That's the question now, I want you to answer. Can we be an idolater? Can we be idolaters in the faith? Yes. Yes, we can. How? You're right, we can. For instance, when I was growing up, there was the pastor of the church. The what? The pastor of the church was considered perfect. Oh, oh, that, the, 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 that was, he was our idol. I thought you said he was a sinner. But you were no. saying sinner. No, we were supposed to, uh, you know, yeah, every good. word and he, every word he said was and you trusted policemen, doctors, teachers, anybody in authority, you looked up to them, you respected them, you gave them the due respect that they had as having been trained to be who or what type of profession they had. Okay? Now, did you idolize it? Some of them? Yeah, well, you know, you thought they were perfect. <laughs> they wouldn't do anything wrong. You know, of course, no, they found I... out differently when after they grew up. But... Randall, I don't ever remember thinking that my preacher was perfect. <laughs> and after I became one, I knew they weren't. <laughs> I hadn't met a perfect preacher yet. Billy Graham came pretty close. Well, we had a pastor named D.L. Moody. And afterwards, you know, he read, you know, things he didn't want to go to the same and blah, blah, blah. And now I realize his name was Donald L. Moody and he was not the same person. Divide that one. You said a form of idolatry if you're pretending to worship it. When you're going through the motions, you're doing it because it's Sunday and you're there and, and you've got no better offer. You just want to, yes, idolatry is when Bob said, it's when you're just going through the motions of worship and you're really not worshiping. When you come to his table, you're just simply taking a piece of bread and a little cup of juice. It, there's no meaning left for you at that time. It doesn't happen all the time. There are times when it blows you away, doesn't it? You're just overwhelmed by, by the beauty of His grace. 
generally speaking, we want the devotion. Preachers just go through devotion to begin with. What are what other ways some idolaters have prayed? What are the things in the act like? We can put so much credit on the prayer. And 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 after and this is something I'm just regurgitating from what you said earlier. Yeah. Really. Really we can idolize prayer. prayer. And that's where we get this these statements that we preachers are with all of them. Well, it wasn't well. I think you go over this real well. Prayer works. God didn't have anything to do with it, but prayer works. You heard that statement before? And you maybe you said I've said the statement before. Prayer works. Uh, there's another one real close to that one. Prayer changes things. Changes is me, maybe. We're, we're idolizing prayer when prayer becomes capitalized and it's not the first word of the sentence. When prayer becomes as important as God. When faith becomes as important as God. Or when our image as a Christian becomes as important as the image of Christ, we have become a dollar. Now, another thing we've done is be musicians. I don't know how you can get out of it, and I don't know we won't do it. You go up there and you play the organ, you play the piano, and you sing in the choir. And, and, well, we're going to let the choir perform for us today. Choirs don't perform. No, some choirs do. And some choristers perform. Some musicians perform. Some choir directors perform. Some preachers perform. Worship is not a We present what we've studied and learned. And quite a bit. Some school teachers. And on the other hand, you say, well, I, I couldn't carry a tin in a bucket. I couldn't preach in a pulpit. I couldn't preach some school lesson. But I can warm up to you. Well, pew warmers are making a gift of being there. And when they reach into their pocketbook and pull out a check, Cash or whatever, they're they're, they're presenting a gift, not a performance. How do you know this? Do you remember the occasion in the Gospels when Jesus was looking at the widow, and she, Bishop uh, Smith, I don't know if you know, 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 Bishop Smith preached on the widow's mind one day and he said, and he gave us an image. He said, You, you know how the back of this thing was full of sack. Dump that out on a piece of paper, roll it up, stick it, twirl it in, and then light it up. That back of you can get your cigarettes and come back in. He said, Imagine that little dirty grind in the back of the sack with two pins. She dumped it out. It's dirty. He looked over and he saw all of the prince and the, and the, and the prowess of the Pharisees who were handing wads of cash and thinking that they were doing more than what she was doing. And he said, She did it more than he did. So the reason that I was on begins with the letter I. Yes, thank you. Yes. Anything that replaces him is an idol. If for me it's preaching or teaching, if for me it is giving, if for me it is witnessing, if it, if it is, if it, if it, if it, if it, if it 
my talking to others about becoming Christian, if that replaces him, then whatever it is, it has become an idol for me at that time. And it can be prayer. Yes. It can be a hymn. It can be a lump of money out of the pocket. Check. Let me know you start being prayed on. No, y'all are going to start charging that whatever they charge you, you are it. You add that to it. Um, it. Idolatry is not just outside of the kingdom. Idolatry in its worst form is in the kingdom. I expect them to do that because they don't think or know that the kingdom is available to them or they have chosen not to be in the kingdom. When I started preaching, Oh Lord, I've started preaching. We're going to take a call from you, huh? Uh, I, we expect that of them. We don't expect any more than that of them. We just don't expect it of us. And we're as guilty as they are. Just a different thing. So don't pray. Please. Ask him to make you aware that he's here. Ask him to. Ask of him. Then suddenly you realize the faith that you were worried about being so weak has become boisterous and strong. Not because you asked for it, because his presence made it that way. Uh, all right, we're going to have stuff. I, I see you're getting fancy now. Uh, that's just like on Sunday morning, you know, God gives it to things where it's from 11 and 12. And preacher ran to the people over the clubs. God, that's the club, so they couldn't do that club as you <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, we could, we could work on this uh, immorality, impurity, greed. You know, we could work on that for the, for the next month on that. But I don't want us to spend a lot of time on it or we'll start practicing it. But rather the giving of thanks. We will pick up with that. That is in verse um, 47. The giving of thanks. Uh, that's verse 4. We'll pick up with just for a few moments. Next Thursday, the weather permitting, then we'll, we'll just continue to walk around and do that.